again, welcome everybody. My name is Debbie, as I told you. I am actually a forester and a wildlife biologist. So this is one of my favorite classes because I get to teach you all about animals and how we can learn about them, how we get clues about them. And we're going to be looking at the biodiversity, that's the animal life and the plant life of our East Bay Hills. Okay, so if you've lived here a short time or a long time, it doesn't matter. We will get you out and introduced to the area. So again, if you have any questions or need more information, that's our website, the msnucleus.org. You can always go to that to look up information. And again, our phone numbers, if any of you are having technical issues logging in, Hagos is here to answer those questions for you. But today we're gonna to be talking about the diversity of organisms in our Southern East Bay foothills. All right, we're going to be looking at the diversity of the East Bay Hills, primarily that top group, the big animalia. Those are the vertebrates, the ones with the backbones. You can feel your backbone, back of your neck, okay? These larger vertebrates, the reptiles, amphibians, fish, birds, and mammals, okay? But that second group in the blue is also very important. Those are those smaller animals. If you don't have those smaller animals, there's nothing for those larger animals to eat, right? If a bird doesn't have the smaller spiders and worms, then can that bird make it? No, it can't, it can't survive. So again, there's different um, classes of animals that we're gonna be looking at and how they interact with the environment. And things are getting tight here in California, right? We don't have a lot of water and we don't have a lot of space. And so as more people move into the area, we're pushing those animals further back. So in that area where the wild meets the urban, the city, um, that's kind of an area where sometimes our wild animals come in and join us and we see those animals um, in our environment. So that's why we wanted to do this is kind of let you know a little bit about these animals in case you do happen to see them. All right, so the area we're talking about is around Dry Creek Pioneer Regional Park um, at Union City. So at Dry Creek, there's obviously there a dry creek. When there is the um, hundred year flood, that area does <laughs> flood because it comes down the hills, all the gullies. But as you look at this hillside, you see those orange flowers? Those are your poppies, your California poppies. So you see these nice rolling hills. Some of it has cattle on it. Some of it has had sheep or goats on it. Um, you see different varieties of trees. You see very tall trees that are old and then the younger shrubs. We see some smaller creeks. So we've got a lot of different areas for these animals to live in. Now this is at the Masonic home there on Union City. We're up on top behind the home up on some of their land. They've got about 200 some acres and we're looking away from the bay. So we're looking back towards um, the inland. And as you look at these hills, see how they're so round? And that has happened over years and years with the erosion, with wind and, and rain, primarily the rain, carving those hills down so that they're not real sharp. Um, as you get those deep ravines, the water of course collects in those ravines so you see how we have all the trees down there in the ravines. So we're up about 2000 feet um, at the top of this hillside. And again, you can see there are areas where there's more moisture. So there's getting a little green grass. This was taken earlier before it started to rain. And you can see some trails that are farther back there. So this gets into, um, again, the East Bay Regional Parks where they are preserved. So there's not as much traffic, not as many humans coming through. Um, but again, as you get more moisture, you get more organisms. That's the big thing to remember. Now, standing at the same place, we just turned around the other way. Now we're looking out into the bay. If you look out, see where that layer of fog is and you see some mountains on top, those mountains on top are the ones that you have to go over to get to Santa Cruz. The fog is lying over the bay, the water, and then those few little hills, that's Coyote Hills. And then you've got all the regions then of Fremont and Union City. Now this area down here, there's a little yurt at the bottom and this area of, of trees has been planted for several years now. They're actually big enough now you can see them from BART, yay. But this kind of gives you an idea of the
control airplanes. So that I think there's only this place and then maybe one in Livermore that has permission to do that. And they do like to share those skills with kids. So if you are interested in doing that, get in touch with us, let us know, we'll get you in touch with them. So anyway, so this is looking at a yurt. Yurt is a round building. And again, they, we use it for storage of some materials and the guys with their airplanes. Now, again, we are trying to create a new habitat for these local animals, because as we expand out more and more, again, those animals are getting pushed back and pushed back. They're losing their resources. So again, we're trying to put around native plants. So this area all around the yurt, we've put in all kinds of native plants. So we're growing those for the herbivores. Those are the plant eaters. And then the herbivores, once those plant eaters come in, then that's going to attract more of your omnivores, the ones that eat everything, and also your larger carnivores, your meat eaters, okay? Now let's look at some of these little critters. These are the ones without a backbone. We call them invertebrates. Spiders, worms and ants all over the place doing their job. Now you may think, oh, spiders and ants, but they are very important. They break up the soil, they help decompose the material and that adds to the soil. Um, but again, these are little critters that other animals need for food, okay? Again, important part of the ecosystem. And if one chain breaks, then a lot of things can fall apart. Now these arthropods, these insects and the annelids like the worms, again, play an important role. Now, up there we've planted a lot of milkweed that attracts butterflies. So this was a while back, we had all these painted ladies come through. Look at all of those butterflies. They came in like that, like this huge flock, hundreds and hundreds of them. Now the painted lady, if you can see it on the flower at the bottom, it's orange and the black and white stripes. It is different than this butterfly. Okay, see how the coloring is different on this one? All right, so that is the painted lady. That's usually the one that you'll get if you order some from those catalogs and all to grow. But the painted lady makes very tiny eggs. Look at that red paper clip. See those little white dots? Those are the eggs of a painted lady. For the painted lady butterfly, they do tend to lay them kind of in clusters and you see them hiding out on these pride of Madeiras. They've got a long tongue that kind of rolls up. It's called a proboscis and that has to reach down into the flower to get to the nectar of that plant. And our life cycle again starts as an egg, moves to the caterpillar or the larva, then it creates that pupa where it's gonna go through its chemical and physical change it's called the, and it's a chrysalis for a butterfly. And then finally the adult comes out. Now, if this was a moth, we would the same thing, have an egg, a larva, instead of a chrysalis, we'd have a cocoon and then a butterfly. A lot of beetles go through the same thing where they're egg, larva, and they make a pupa and come out as a beetle. So again, there are many different types of animals that you can find. Now this painted lady, this is a storybook that we have that is on our website if you want to look at it again. Um, it just tells you more about this organism. So here we go. The painted lady, species name Vanessa Carduti by Joyce Bluford, animated by Doris Rea and Hagos Tavolti. Vanessa found a lilac chrysalis, the pupa stage a caterpillar made, attached to a mallow plant hanging under a leaf for shade. A few days before, the caterpillar, dark brown, spiny with light stripes, kept eating and shedding its skin, looking like different types. The caterpillar knew, after three weeks or so, chemicals in its body will signal it's time to go. Hanging motionless with fits of a wig and a wag, the caterpillar was changing in its little sleeping bag. Weeks before, a female painted lady laid her little green eggs. A caterpillar emerged in a week, crawling on its many legs. 
A month before they moved to the north, the butterflies took flight. They migrated from the south in spring. It was a miraculous sight. Vanessa was wise and let the chrysalis be. As the lilac turned reddish brown, the wing colors you could now see. The chrysalis began to peel and emerged a butterfly. The blood from its abdomen pumped the wings to fly. The painted lady was beautiful, thought Vanessa to herself. The lady could fly and even land on a shelf. The lady looked for flowers so its proboscis could suck up food. When night arrives, they keep warm in a brood. Vanessa witnessed metamorphosis and was proud that she can see. She now knew the secrets of how a butterfly came to be. So this is the end of the little poem. And this shows the life cycle of the painted lady. It goes from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to butterfly. And it continues on and on. Okay. The end. All right. So I'm always amazed that I see so many butterflies flying around down here, even in the city. So one of their problems, of course, is as we grow, we mow down all of their food. We, they don't have the milkweed here anymore. If they're migrating through, they used to be a food source here, now there's not. How are they gonna get the energy to keep going in their migration? So it's important to even, if you've got just a small house or live in an apartment, anything you can do to put even a small pot out, it helps the, the, give these migrating animals a chance. So these are a type of milkweed. Now we know it's a milkweed because you see that picture on the top right where it's broken and some white stuff's coming out. It's not milk coming out. It's kind of a more sticky, almost like glue. It's the sap of the milkweed plant and all of the milkweed plants do this. And what's funny about this fluid that's from the plant is that it makes the caterpillars taste awful to the birds. So that's a great thing, huh? So it's a couple other caterpillars mimic the colors of the monarchs and all. Um, so again, this milkweed, these, uh, this is what the caterpillars need. Um, the eggs are laid on the plants as well. This tropical milkweed that has the orange and the purple and the yellow, it's really bright. Um, again, that's where you will find the caterpillars feeding, um, the adults eating the nectar, and then the eggs on those leaves. This other variety is a thin leafed. Let's see that. This is the narrow leaf milkweed and you can see the petals are pointing up and down allowing for maximum uh, use by the beetles and any other animal that would be feeding on the pollen or the nectar. All right so there you see those orange and black bugs those are milkweed beetles. So I can go up and pick those up there they don't care about me they are busy just trying to eat their nectar and pollen. They're just busy on their milkweed plants. Um, so again, you see those all around the milkweed. Now this is another type, the showy milkweed. This is a showy milkweed and you can see the blossoms are five petal, kind of like on a snowball. Notice that it is full of nectar so you have um, lots of bumblebees and flies and uh, milkweed beetle on the area. Okay so anytime you have a plant that's got the sweet nectar the hummingbirds like it as well you're going to have the bees the bees aren't interested in you they're just trying to get to their food um, you've got those milkweed beetles did you see the ants too so you've got a lot of flowers that have that are attracted to um, the ants to them as well so just be aware that if you do end up gardening some or you have a flower garden insects are part of it that's we need those insects to help pollinate now these milkweeds have a lot of different flower diversity and so we talked a little bit about how that showy milkweed had some up and some down. Do you see on this milkweed, the yellow parts? See, it's almost got these like, like 
flowing into some buckets. <laughs> and then the orange ones, again, are kind of hanging out at the bottom. Now, what insects do you see there? You see those big old chunky caterpillars? Now, those caterpillars are from the monarchs. And those guys look like they are getting ready to do their J, their hanging J, and turn into their chrysalis, because those are looking pretty beefy. So our monarch butterfly, this is my little puppet that I had here. This was the coloring of the monarch. And you see it's got the dots all the way around the wings, whereas that painted lady only had them at the front. Now look at this caterpillar. What colors do you see? White, black, and kind of a yellow or a yellow green. And then those colors are repeated. So again, birds, when they see this, that's a warning to them to stay away, that they don't taste good. They're not a good food source. And notice how they also have antenna on each end of their body. So it's hard for the bird to tell where their head is. But as you look at this, you can see that it's eating those leaves. So as a caterpillar, it doesn't care about the flowers. It's only after the leaves. It's not until it's an adult that it's going to be a, pay attention to those flowers and look for the nectar. All right. So we, here's our adult monarch, and this is a female. And you go, hmm, how do you know it's a girl? Because there are no dots. And you're like, what? If you look at the body of that monarch, then we're talking right down here. At this part of the wing, there will be some dots. Now, this little monarch is hanging out on this lilac bush. Let's see if it moves around any. It's got the dots all the way around the wing. It has the dots on its body, its legs, its legs, the antenna. But I didn't see any dots. So to compare, which is always a good thing to do in science, you make your observation and then you compare and contrast. So here's a male monarch. Can you see the dots? You see at the bottom of the wings, at the end of that abdomen. There's two little dots. This is a male monarch. You can see that it has these dart dots. You can see they have a little um, relief to them. Those are where they have pherons to uh, attract the female. So this is a male. All right, and you see that butterflies pumping its wings, it does that for its circulation. That's how it has to get its blood through its body. And when the butterfly is resting, their wings are always folded up. If it's a moth, they rest with their wings flat out against the plant or against the wall. All right, so again, for our life cycle for the monarch, very similar to that of the painted lady, only parts are a little different. So this is an egg of the monarch butterfly just one egg. They don't lay in clusters, they don't lay bunches, they just lay one at a time. And notice it's kind of a yellow green, but those little dots are actually pretty gold looking. They have gold little dots that run all along the outside of the egg. And again, here's a closer look of that larva, the caterpillar. And you can see its mouth part up there where it's eating the leaf of the milkweed. So it's got the two big antenna, the six true legs, and then these legs in the back are kind of like little Velcros. They're not true legs. And then it creates, after it goes through about seven different stages of growing and gets bigger and bigger and plumper and plumper, it does the chrysalis where it does all of its changing. And now what we call it is eclose when it's getting ready to come out of an egg or out of a chrysalis. So make your prediction or your guess right now, what part of the butterfly is going to come out first? So the chrysalis has kind of been hatched open some. I see black and white. Do you remember what part of the body was black and white? Oh, I see a little bit of orange. So this is a time lapse where it's, this is over several minutes. Okay, there's the head is all the way out and it's using its long legs to hold on to that chrysalis. It's gotta hang on to that chrysalis. Did you see the wings? They're all still wet and squished up like this, okay? If that 
Um, butterfly loses the chrysalis, if it falls to the ground, it is not gonna be able to get those wings to function correctly, okay? Now, this is one that's been out for a little bit and look at how the abdomen is full of blood. That, notice the wings are real short and small compared to this one on the other side. So this butterfly has to hang for a little while and it has to pump its wings and get those wings to stretch out and get the blood flowing because right now all of that blood is caught up in the abdomen. So after about 24 hours, those wings are dry and then we'll release them. These are some that we had in our classroom at Tule Ponds. Um, but again, it takes, that, it takes about 24 hours before they're able to release. And we just have them in the classroom so that you guys can get a closer look at them. All right, this is an activity that your teachers can get to you or give you directions of how to get. Um, teachers, they're on the same website where you went to register for class. And this is just making a monarch life cycle. Evie's showing you kind of how to put it together. It's just cutting two pieces of paper out using a little metal brad. And then it can spin so that you are reminded. Again, the egg is member kind of a yellow color with the golden dots and then try to get your colors right on your caterpillar, your chrysalis, and then your adult monarch, okay? So that is a life cycle. Again, don't worry about it if you don't have it yet. Your teachers can get that to you if they want you to do it, okay? All right, so now we're gonna move on to some of the larger animals that we find in the East Bay. And if you look at this picture, we've done a lot of dirt work up there. We've gotten ready to plant a whole bunch of trees. Um, so we have disturbed some of that dirt. We've been putting compost up there to make the soil better. And as you look out, you're looking towards San Francisco. So on a clear day, you can see all the way to San Francisco. But as you look back at these hills, remember they're kind of softly rolling, eroded by the rain. And down in the valleys, down in those ravines is where the moisture collects. So of course, that's where we have our line of trees that are started. Now this pasture right next to us, there are some horses there. I don't know if you can see them right on the ridge top. Um, as a horse pasture, horses have front teeth on the top and bottom. So when they eat grass, they're taking the whole root. Um, so they are very rough on um, grass environment. But this is just to show you how diverse this area is that we're gonna be looking at. So we have our grasslands, we have forested areas, and we have ponds and creeks. Pretty much all the way from, say, ponds to um, granite quarries, kind of our area. There you see the bay off in the distance and Coyote Hills. Oh, I see a soccer field. I think that's Guy Emanuel. So everything, and again, a lot of construction up here. But you see a fair bit of trees, though. So we've done pretty good keeping some trees around. Um, but again, lots of buildings. So again, we're trying to balance all this out. So the animals that we're gonna find as far as reptiles in the East Bay, the turtles are only gonna be around your wet areas. Um, your snakes and lizards are gonna like anywhere that's warm. So a lot of times we have the little um, lizards hanging out like on the side of the building, on the side of the yurt. All right, this is one of our local snakes that you may find in your area when you're walking in the parks or in your backyards. This is a Pacific gopher snake and it grows up to eight feet. It eats small mammals and it's got this pattern kind of of little cubes on the back, little squares. Mm -hmm. Its head is not that big. Body's actually bigger than its head. See how long it is? A good eight feet. And there are many different types of gopher snakes and this is a type of snake that can be rats and mice, so they're good ones to have around your house. They are not poisonous, but they do have teeth. And if you were to disturb them or scare them, they can still bite you, but usually they want to run away from you. They're more afraid of you than you are of them. And same thing with these garter snakes. Look at this pile of snakes. These garter snakes are smaller but they can move very, very fast. All snakes can swim as well. They get up to about six feet and they again eat the small mammals, the rats, the mice, the voles. They like to be around the grassy areas. 
you might run into them if you're mowing the grass or you're running out in a field, something like that. But again, they are much more afraid of us. Usually when you stomp your feet, they would feel the vibration on the ground and they would try to move on out of the way. All right, this one, hopefully you don't ever run into. Now we do run into it at the very top of those hills when we were up at the top of um, the area there at Masonic in the fields, those grassy fields where it's very dry, that's where we find the rattlesnake. This is the Northern Pacific rattlesnake, likes those grassy lands. Again, it eats gophers, squirrels. So it's part of the food chain. It does its part in um, population control. And again, it's known for that rattle. I think I have a little story here. Listen to this little bit. Meet the animals. Episode 14, Rattlesnake. Uh-oh! Who are you? I'm a rattlesnake. Rattlesnakes are reptiles. Where do you live? Rattlesnakes live in North and South America. We live in prairies, forests, and deserts. What's on your tail? That's my rattle. We shake our rattles to warn enemies. What do you eat? We mostly eat small animals. We love rabbits, mice, and prairie dogs. How do you find food? Our tongues are shaped like forks. They help us smell prey. We can sense heat from prey, too. You have big fangs! We use our fangs to bite. The bite kills our prey. Then we swallow the animal whole. Do rattlesnakes shed their skin? Yes, we shed our skin as we grow. We rub against rocks to loosen it. Then we crawl right out of our skin. Goodbye. Goodbye, rattlesnake. Okay, so as you're looking at this picture of a rattlesnake, you see how it's different than the gopher snake? They both have kind of a brownish pattern, but the rattlesnake is more like got the diamonds on its back versus the squares or rectangles that the gopher snake had. Um, the rattlesnake also has a more of a V-shaped head and the gopher snake, the non-poisonous heads was, was thinner. Um, but the only true way to tell if a snake is poisonous or not are to look at the scales underneath its tail. Well, by the time you're that close, you're close enough to be bitten, right? So as far as snakes go, best thing to do is again, just let them do their thing, back away from them, um, make some noise, they'll feel the vibration and they will move on. Now talking about the snakes, about their rattlesnake, um, that rattle is, like different compartments and the compartments shake together like this when it rattles, but it can shake its tail 50 to 100 times a second. That's pretty fast. If you have a maraca at home, think about that, how fast you could move a maraca, how many times you could wiggle it in a second. Okay, that is a pretty amazing feature of that snake. All right, let's keep going. Oh, a king snake's another one you might run into. This isn't a poisonous snake, it's non-poisonous found in the grasslands and it's another constrictor. So it does have teeth. So it uses those teeth to hold on to its prey and then it wraps around the prey. Everybody put your hands down on your ribs. Put your hands on your rib cage on each side. Now take a big deep breath. When you do, what happens to those ribs? Blow it out. Do it again. Take a big breath in and blow it out. So what this snake does, a constrictor wraps around the prey that it's trying to eat and it constricts so that that animal can't take a breath in. If their lungs can't expand, 
then they can't breathe. And eventually that animal will um, become their prey. So again, that's how a constricting snake works different than a poisonous snake. So again, you see the pattern. Again, lots of different varieties. And now we're going to move on to those mammals. So look in this big black walnut tree. Can you find the mammal? It's trying to disguise itself. See the little brown tree squirrel? It's busy eating a black walnut. That's one of their favorites. Yeah, you know, if you have bird feeders out that squirrels are very, very smart and they'll come and steal all your bird food, but they need food as well. Um, so again, this is looking at the Western gray squirrel and this Western gray squirrel, it lives up in the trees. It's native to the Bay Area and it spends all of its time eating and it collects some food for it to eat, but then it also saves some food and it calls that a cache. It's called a sea. A-C-H-E. So it'll dig and bury a few acorns, it'll eat an acorn. It'll bury an acorn, it'll eat an acorn. So then later on when it needs it, when it's running out of its food source, it can smell where it's put all those caches of acorns around. But of course, sometimes they forget some of them and then those will grow in, into seeds. Um, those of you that came a little bit early, I showed you this skull. This is from a beaver, but I wanted to show you it just because it has very similar teeth to our squirrels and our rats, anything that's a rodent. This beaver has the very large incisors you see there, but same as the squirrel, where those teeth are continually growing. So that's why they always have to chew on everything. They have to be able to wear those down. All right, now if you look at that squirrel, the way he's fluffing that tail all around, that's part of his communication as well to other squirrels. <coughs> And that's one of their alarm calls. So you can try to imitate that sound back to a squirrel and they'll kind of look at you funny. All right, another squirrel is our California ground squirrel. Now these guys are super cute, but boy, they can make a mess because they can dig underneath all of our homes, under sidewalks, under buildings, um, out in the fields, they can make big giant holes as well, and their burrows usually connect to each other. They have different rooms underneath in their burrows. Um, they're a lot smaller than the tree squirrel. Um, they still have the tails. They kind of have more spots on them um, and stripes on their tails, and they are omnivores. They eat a little bit of everything. If you look down on this left side, you see where the orange flowers are and the purple flowers are? Watch this little guy. He's got a piece of flower there that he's trying to eat. Oh no, he lost the flower. Now oh, he's too lazy to get that piece. Let me go over here where it's a little bit easier. So these little guys that hang out next to our yurt, we do um, feed them a few snacks every now and then. But he's taken the easy way out. But you see, he's very mobile. They're very either quick, quick, they're fast to run around. They make all kinds of screams and cries to each other. They like to live underneath the wood piles, and rock piles but they're cute. So again, the brown squirrels are everywhere. All right, another thing that you may find in your yards as well as up there are these gophers. And now this gopher is really kind of funny looking. So he's digging with his front feet really super fast, kicks it out with his back legs. So he's trying, and he doesn't have much of a tail. He's trying to make a hole. He's gonna get mad at us in just a minute. Wait for it. Those ears are so tiny because he's made for going through those little brown passages. Oh, see how he came and hissed at us? We got too close with our cameras. <laughs> so he is, again, very busy digging. He's got to get underground because there are hawks and eagles and vultures, all kinds of other animals, foxes that are looking at him for dinner. So he's got to get hiding. All right, raccoons. They're also very clever and very adaptable. So they are omnivorous. They eat all different kinds of food, um, but they're very clever and well adapted to living with us in our city. In fact, I had some living in my attic. They had used, they had pushed 
part of my siding and we're using it like a dog door. They could just get in and out, come in and out, um, even had babies up in the attic. And I heard a lot of chatter and a lot of scratching on the walls. Um, but look at this cute little raccoon here that's eating its grapes. So again, you see their hands. So they're very good with their hands. Nice big eye sockets. Um, but they do have those very sharp teeth, similar to these. Um, but this little guy probably was a rehab where he wasn't able to be released out into the wild. They are a vector that can carry rabies. So they do not make good pets because they're, um, they'll tear everything up. But again, this little raccoon is living underneath our building, which is weird that we would see him during the day because they are nocturnal. So we were making some noise. He just poked his head out to see what we were doing. And then he that's the kind of chatter you get from a raccoon. All right, now this is a badger. Anybody ever seen a badger? Usually not. These won't, you usually won't see these down here. You got to go up in the hills. So there's our badger. Now we see deer a lot in these fields when you're driving down um, Mission Boulevard and you see those big grasslands, they're used for hay, they're by um, Masonic. You'll see deer and turkeys a lot there. Now, if you look carefully at this picture, you'll see there are two baby deer and then there's three other adults, probably all females. But the two little babies have been told to stay right there by moms. A lot of times the babies forget, they get distracted or see something interesting and they leave the area. And that's when they get in trouble where well, people will find them and think they've been an orphaned fawn and they take them in. So if that ever happens, leave them there. Mom has told them to stay put, to stay there. And this is the sound that you hear from a mule deer. I don't think that's what they're expecting, is it? They make a couple different sounds, not what you would usually expect from a deer. All right, we also have fox. Our red fox are probably the thing that you're gonna see the most, the species you'll see the most. And there are lots of sightings. Um, the red fox eats mostly rodents, mostly the small little mice, voles, um, ground squirrels. Um, the red fox has, like black socks on its legs. Look at that picture where he's standing up on the log. Looks like he has kind of black socks and the end of his tail is white. There's also a gray fox that's a little bit smaller and the gray fox has a black tail and a black stripe down the back and kind of a pepper colored fur, okay? But what's really cool about that gray fox is that it can climb trees. It's only one of three species that can actually climb trees. So as you look at this fox, um, again, the foxes are Smaller than you think, kind of like a small dog. That's the sound. It almost sounds more like a bird. Sometimes the, the animal control and police get calls all the time about kids screaming and it's actually a fox. All right, now coyotes, again, a larger gray colored animal. It's taller than the fox and it's Scientific name is Canis latrans, which means barking dog. And they are actually good friends and buddies with the badger. Remember that one that was digging the hole and then he turned around and looked at us? So these guys will sometimes share dens. We've even had pictures where we've shown the um, coyote resting his head like on his little beaver friend or his little um, badger friend. So they, they work together because they live in some of the same places. So the coyote won't dig their own den necessarily. They'll use an old badgers. They live about 10 years in the wild, uh, longer in captivity, and they're carnivores here. They're actually carnivores with their teeth, but they will eat everything from fish and birds. Even in the springtime, they eat lots of plums. So again, you they 
eat so many different things. Again, carnivore by teeth, but omnivore by what they eat. And this is what a coyote sounds like. <laughs> Now they have a very complex language. So they have many different calls um, that mean different things to the other coyotes, okay? And now a bobcat is something that we see sometimes. Bobcat is known for that short little tail. That's what a bob is called, the bobtail. It's a short tail. Look at him way up there on those power lines. How did he get way up there? He climbed, they've got great balance, okay? Then the cat family. Pointed ears, short tail, medium size, and probably the meanest of all of these things that we've talked about. And this is what a bobcat sounds like. That's a pretty grumpy sound in bobcat. So the bobcat isn't very tolerant of other species like fox and coyotes. Um, they are very reclusive. They like to do their own thing. All right, the largest cat that we have in our East Bay Hills is the mountain lion. Again, cougar has lots of different names, puma, um, lots of different names again, but it is the largest cat. Now it lives about eight to 13 years ranges from 120 to about 220 pounds for a large male. That's a lot of cat. You see him running through at the water. Imagine if he was running at you, that would be kind of scary. But look at the cute little baby on the far left. Cute little baby. So it takes a lot of animals to sustain an animal this size, right? Has to have a lot of prey. So if the prey starts, they start losing some of those lower chains in the, the link, then large animals like this are not going to be able to survive. All right, let's see if we can hear what he sounds like. Again, they have a huge vocabulary, means lots of different things. These cats tend to hang out by themselves. And if you're ever out hiking and you see some, again, all you have to do is make yourself big and make some noise and they'll go about their way. They are not interested in you. All right, now these wild boars, they are not a native species. They came over, the Spaniards, when they came way back, they brought over um, wild boars with them for food. And then um, Easterners came and they brought some more pigs and then some of them got wild. So now we have these weird hybrid wild hogs. Um, some of them can be very huge. They tend to hang back in the shadows, like back in the deep ravines, in the cool waters. They like to wallow around in the creeks and the mud. Um, they hang out in the shade during the day and will come out more at night. And they are very disruptive as far as our restoration because they use that big snout to push and move everything around. Now I have a skull right here. And I don't know if I can see if I can get it close enough. You see these big tusks here, these adapted teeth. So it uses those big tusks to help move stuff around. And again, it will eat just about anything. There's another, it's missing tusks on the bottom as well. And those two tusks rub together and constantly get sharper and sharper and sharper. So again, they're very um, disruptive pest in our area. Here's what they sound like. <laughs> So again, he's puzzling through the grass, can tear up your landscape, can make a mess of it, tearing up the vegetation to get to the small invertebrates and all that are underneath. So again, that's our wild boar. Those, we see a lot of those up there at Masonic. All right, and as far as birds, we get all kinds of birds. Uh, large birds like this turkey vulture with the red head. Those are the ones that you see circling in the middle of the day when they're flying on the thermals. And those are eating dead animals, the carrion. 
And then you've got your smaller fruit birds, songbirds. Um, again, variety of an animals. The more different variety we, of things that we plant, as far as plants go, that's going to bring in the diversity of the animals. So again, our plan is to restore that habitat and the food sources so that we can get more things coming in. Now, one thing that's neat that's happened is that we have seen a comeback of our eagles. So these are the American bald eagle, the very large bird of prey. And the bald eagle that you see here with the white head, that is the symbol of the United States, but we have golden and bald. Look at this eagle. Do you see what he just caught? Here, we'll watch it one more time. He's coming in with his, gets his talons out front and he grabs a fish. Yes, bald eagles, most of their diet is fish. So you always find them close to a water source. Now, again, we have the bald and the golden eagle. And also up there, we have peacocks. They are not native to the United States. They are part of the regional park there of Dry Creek. It's my understanding that years ago, someone brought some of them in and um, the colony has stayed there ever since. So they are a forest kind of bird. This is a male that you're seeing with the long tail. And if it's trying to impress a girl, then he takes those feathers and puts them way up and shakes them. And those feathers look like they all have eyes on them. So that's to confuse other predators and make him look super handsome. But again, this is a peacock originally from India. And when you move into those Dry Creek apartments, my understanding, they make you sign something that says you won't mind the peacocks. But I can hear them a mile away when I'm at Masonic. So here's what a peacock sounds like. Isn't that funny? They're so loud. So again, this is a park where you can go walking and hiking. It's a nice little shaded trail for a while and you'll see the peacocks all around. They'll be scratching around in the grass and then at night or late afternoon, they go up into the trees. They can fly just enough to get up into those trees where it's safe for them to sleep. All right, we also have the wild turkeys all through there. And again, these turkeys, because the Masonic home is kind of a um, closed in area, we do have a lot of the deer and the turkeys that are pretty much everywhere. And you see these guys that are just walking around. The other day, there were about 30 males that were all making a ruckus. They were all being teenagers, being crazy and running around. Um, but again, they just kind of roam wherever they want to go. A lot of the residents like to see them. And again, all they care about is looking for their food source. They're looking for seeds. They're looking for invertebrates like worms and bugs. And again, they come up and use the water sources and the turkey, the simple gobble. All right, so for this activity, you may or may not have this sheet yet. If you don't have it, don't worry about it, but it's just a simple reminder of some of the animals that you have seen today. And I'll go ahead and play this. We're looking at biodiversity in the East Bay Hills. There's a worksheet your teacher will give you that has all these different animals that live up in the hills. Once you get the animals, as you've seen in our presentation today, you can color those animals using crayons or markers, and then you can also cut some of them out. And then I've started my picture here with a blue sky because I did have an eagle flying, and then I did some steep green hills because right now, the springtime, the hills are a little bit green color. So I've cut out so far my mountain lion, a king snake, my ground squirrels hiding over here, a red fox and my eagle, and I've got a king snake here that I can get glue down. Maybe we'll put it over here because again, king snakes like where it's dry, they don't like where it's wet. I've got a raccoon, and you see these others, so I just need to trim those down a little more. It's up to you as far as how long you want to cut it down, and then you can place these different animals all through your habitat. You can give them extra trees, rocks to hide under. Use your imagination and create a fantastic habitat for these animals of the East Bay Hills. Okay, so that is the end of our presentation.